In this video, we're going to discuss the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which result in a series of numbers, what we call quantum numbers. So what we're going to do is discuss what these quantum numbers mean. The quantum numbers basically represent the physical properties of the orbitals themselves, as well as the electrons that occupy the orbital. The quantum number that we want to talk about is something called the principal quantum number. This is a quantum number that represents the size and the energy level of the orbital. Quantum numbers, like all quantum mechanical properties, they tend to have only discrete values. So, and for n, which is the principal quantum number, the symbol for the principal quantum number, so if you have a larger value of n, in other words, 3 versus 2, for example, that means you have two things. You have a larger orbital size, and you have a higher orbital energy. Well, if your orbital is larger, that means your electron is more likely to be further away from the nucleus. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if it has higher orbital energy, that means the electron, of course, is less stable energetically. Now, the interesting thing about this n from quantum mechanics, it happens to be also the n that Bohr uses to represent his orbit of the electron in the hydrogen atom. So this is an important meeting of the two models because the Bohr model, if you remember, it works very well for the hydrogen atom. It really describes all the properties of the hydrogen atom with this fairly simple model. However, it doesn't work atoms that contain more than one electron. Quantum mechanics, however, it was using the wave, the standing wave model, to represent the electron. So it's completely different from the Bohr model. However, the fact that quantum mechanics came up with the same type of number, in this case n, that matches the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom, suggests that the quantum mechanical model, even though you're modeling the electron as a wave, that this model is valid and you can use it to predict the properties of atoms with more than one electron. Of course, experimentally we still have to test it, but as you see, the quantum mechanical model actually predicts what we would see in experiments. So the second quantum number that we're going to talk about is called the angular momentum quantum number. This quantum number has a symbol L, and it represents the shape of the orbital. And just like N, it has only certain allowed values, in this case starting from 0, and then 1, 2, 3, and so on, up till the largest value of n minus 1. So in other words, the value of L depends on the value of n. Now, certain values of L, this is a typo, certain values of L are given special names as a result of the way their properties are observed in the spectral line. So if you look carefully at the spectral lines as shown here, you'll find that some of these lines have specific characteristics. This is what we now refer to as the different orbitals uh, that correspond to specific angular momentum quantum number. When the lines are sharp, it turns out that that would correspond to an L value of zero. So then this is also often called the S orbital. You see some lines that are called principal lines. These are L value that's equal to one. And this is now called the P orbital. And then you see fuse lines as shown right here. So then these correspond to L equals two and they're called D orbitals. And then lastly you have some of these lines that are called fundamental lines in the emission spectrum. And this corresponds to a value of L equals 3, which is then called F orbitals for fundamental. The third quantum number called the magnetic angular momentum quantum number. This is a quantum number that represents the magnetic component of the angular momentum. And it describes the orientation of the orbital with allowed values being negative L to positive L. So the three quantum numbers describe the orbital, which is basically analogous to the space that's occupied by the electron, okay? The way you can understand these quantum numbers is to basically relate it with an analogy with apartments in a building. So here I'm showing you know, a, a building consisting of a bunch of different apartments. And you can really think about the entire building as basically the atom itself. So inside the atom, you have all of these different spaces that's allocated for electrons. That's what the orbitals are. Okay, so what are the different quantum numbers then? Well, if you think about n, n basically describes the floor number. In other words, are you on level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, and the size of your apartment? Are you one of these apartments that are bigger, smaller, and so on? L 
The angular momentum quantum number, it describes the shape. In analogy to the apartment, it describes the design of the apartment. You have a rectangular shape apartment, square, circular, triangular, and so on. And lastly, M sub L, that represents the direction of the apartment that you occupy. So for example, this apartment are all facing this way. These apartments at the other end are facing that way. So in other words, are you north facing, south facing, west, east, and so on. So using the allowed values of each of the quantum number that we just talked about, we can then construct a series of orbitals starting from the lowest value possible. So we're going to start with n. What is the lowest possible value of n? Stop the video and think about it and then write that down. So the lowest possible value of n is n equals 1. And the next value that we have to determine is l. If you remember, L ranges from 0 to N minus 1. Now in this case, N value is equal to 1, so then the highest value of L is 0. There's no higher value than that, okay? Now the next thing is M sub L. M sub L depends on L, and it goes from negative L to positive L. However, because your L here is 0, then the M sub L value can only also be 0. So in other words, at the N equals 1 level, there's only one type of orbital, and that orbital is what we refer to as the 1s orbital. How do we get 1s? The 1 comes from the n. The s, remember, comes from the l value. Remember that l value of 0, that's what we refer to as the s orbital. In this case, the m only has one value, so there's no orientation to this orbital it has just one shape, and that shape is a spherical shape, okay, which we'll talk more about later. Don't forget that wave functions and orbitals are the same thing. So you can also represent this mathematically with a wave function, and the wave function will be written as the following. Psi of 1, 0, 0, where 1 represents the n value, and then 0 is the l, and then the last 0 is for the m. So in other words, psi 1, 0, 0, and 1s are exactly the same thing. Let's now work up the second level of orbitals. Okay, so I want you to start, you can construct this yourself. Start with the next value of n that is possible after n equals 1. So if n is equal to 2, which is the next largest value, remember that l ranges from 0 to n minus 1, which means that there could be two values of l for n equals 2. l could be 0, or l could also be 1. And then from each one of those L values, you have to work up what possible values of M sub L that you can have. So you see that these should be the possible values for M sub L for each of the L values, okay? And so as a result, what you have is the following. You're going to have one orbital, and then you're going to have three orbitals the, in the next uh, L value, right? So all of these are N equals 2. L equals 1, however, the M value could be either negative 1, there will be 1 orbital, 0, second orbital, or plus 1, third orbital. And we can name them. This top one, the 2, 0, 0 orbital, is what we call the 2S orbital. Again, because L is equal to 0, that's the S orbital. Now, this one now, you have N equals 2, L equals 1, which means that this is a 2P orbital. But we have three different values of m, three different orientation of the orbital. So then we call them, if it's this one, it's called 2px. If it's this one, it's called 2py. If it's this one, it's called 2pz. Now you might wonder why isn't it xyz? This is just a convention that was developed for quantum mechanics. In the n equals 2 level, we now have three different orbitals for the l equals 1 quantum number, 2px, 2py, and 2pz, and then for the l equals 0 number, we have one orbital, which is the 2s orbital. If you build this up over and over again, you're going to have a table that looks like that I'm showing you in the next slide. It tells you that for n equals 1, you're going to have certain value of L, and what the orbital is called, and then certain value of M sub L, and so on and so forth, and then how many orbitals there is for that particular level. And if you keep going, we just did this one, N equals 2, you can work out the N equals 3, which of course now are called, one of the orbitals are called 3D orbitals, okay, so that's important. And then of course you can work out N equals 4, where now you also have, in addition to D orbitals, you also have F orbitals. So you should work this out on your own and figure out 
are you coming up with the correct number of orbitals as they show here. So it turns out that the three quantum numbers are describing only the orbital uh, space itself for the electron. Further study actually revealed that we find that in the spectral lines that the electron can actually rotate, okay, that's one way to think about it, in two opposite directions when a magnetic field is applied to the electron. This property is what we call the spin of the electron and it's shown in the next picture right here. When you're putting a magnetic field around the electron and you let this electron fly through, it turns out that the electron might sometimes go up and might sometimes go down. Okay, So this is what we refer to as the two spin states of the electron. Okay, So as a result, the last quantum number is called the magnetic spin quantum number which has a symbol m sub s and in this case it can only have two possible values so it's either a plus one half or a negative one half. Combining all of these uh, quantum numbers together in, uh, for the electron and the orbital, Wolfgang Pauli came up with Pauli's exclusion principle that there's no more than two electrons that can occupy a specific orbital and the reason for this is because each electron must have a unique set of quantum numbers. If you're considering this as an SMC student, you want to think about the fact that every student must have a unique SMC ID number. So obviously if two people have the same ID number, then it gets confusing as far as who can claim the properties that are associated with that specific ID number. An electron must also have a unique set of quantum numbers to differentiate it from other electrons in the atom. So let's see how this is done in principle. If you think about the first level, how many electrons can have these numbers that can occupy this particular orbital? Well, remember that electrons can only have two spin states, either plus one half or negative one half. My m sub s could be either plus one half or negative one half. If you combine all of these things together, that means my two electrons, the first one would be one zero zero plus one half and the second one would be one zero zero minus one half. There's no way I can have another quantum number here because then I would be changing one of these guys which means I would not be in the same orbital again uh, or I have to use one of the existing ones which means I'm just going to repeat either one of these two electrons. So that's pretty much what Pauli's exclusion principle is.